Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Real Talk special edition tonight uh, with me, Emma G. I'm super humbled, blessed, and um, inspired, I guess, uh, to be going live with you all tonight because I am joined by a phenomenal group of musicians that I've been working with for the last two years. Um, called the Capital Grove Collective. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, we are a group of musicians based here in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area uh, that have an emphasis on diversity of culture, diversity of genre, diversity of gender, diversity of sexual identity, and um, that have an emphasis on culture, diversity um, so of culture, I'm, I'm really diversity of genre. I'm thrilled to have everybody here to uh, experience this conversation as we dive deep today um, about how we as human beings can show up um, both artistically and just humanitarianly, uh, if that's even a word, I don't even know, um, in the face of the passing, the, br the, the brutal murder, I guess, um, of George Floyd and the consequential um, repercussions that that has brought along. So um, to open up, uh, that was my little brief overview. Um, obviously, we're going to dig deep tonight, but um, I want to give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves first and foremost. So starting with Ting Lin of Ting Lin Music, um, do you want to introduce yourself once you take yourself off of mute, my love? <laughs> yes, I do. Hi, everybody. My name is Ting Lin. I am a musician, pianist, multi-talented artists here in the DMV area. Um, I am of Chinese de descent. Uh, I'm an Im immigrant. I am a minority. I am a woman. I am an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a, a lot of things. Um, but what I also am is an American and um, I live for what America stands for, which is diversity. We welcome everybody and we accept everybody and we love everybody. So this is why I'm here because um, I feel like this is not a isolated uh, issue. It affects everyone, um, you know, attack on one minorities and attack on all minorities. So that's why I'm here to support. Wonderful, thank you. Billy. Good evening, I'm Billy Mayfield. Uh, long time Washington area, musician, singer, songwriter, I work in uh, corporate and broadcast production whenever I'm not doing music. Thanks for having me. Nick. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick DePinto. I'm a singer songwriter in the Washington, D.C. Uh, music community. Uh, I'm here largely uh, to, to listen, but share also any, any uh, thoughts that I have that I think will be valuable. Uh, if you make a list of the you make a, a list of all the things of the patriarchy, I was born into most of it. So I'm here to sort of listen and, uh, you know, hopefully help us all provide some some solace and answers and progressive ideas for ourselves. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Stephanie. Hey, I'm Stephanie Mathias. I'm a singer, songwriter, violinist, entrepreneur. Um, I am Latina and but I was kind of um, I feel like my parents are whiter than me. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting, interesting background. Um, and I'm just, yeah, I'm also here to listen and I'm here to just show my love and support for, for everyone and, and take a stand. Thank you. Cody. Can't hear you, love, you're on mute. All right. Hey, what's up everybody? My name's Cody Valentine. I am a musician, um, lighting designer. Um, I don't know, just an artist. I do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I was born in Georgia and my upbringing was extremely varied. Um, I grew up in, I was born into a housing project. And then immediately after that, we moved into a house. And then I moved back with my grandma into a housing project. I went to a private elementary school, Christian school, so I got a really good education. Then my mom joined the military, so I went, I lived on a military base and I went to really good schools. I had incredible, um, incredible primary education, secondary. 
Um, and so I, I have friends of all colors for my entire life. I've had friends all across the rainbow. Um, and yeah, I'm here today to share experiences and to share perspective um, because I've been a, a long-term member of this DC music scene for eight years. Thank you. Uh, Solia. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Solia and I'm a singer songwriter here in the DC area. And no surprise, I'm a black woman, hey. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I'm here to contribute to the conversation in the best way that I know how and um, just really talk about it in a way that I feel um, doesn't really get talked about too much in music. Sometimes in music, we're told to just focus on the music, but I think as artists, we have the unique position to talk about our experiences in the way that Nina Simone has been able to, in the way that so many other um, artists that came before us have been able to use their position as artists to speak about the social issues. So we are here to speak about our social issues. Thank you. Um, over to Joey. What's up, everybody? My name is Joey Jenkins. I am uh, also very obviously a Black American. I am uh, raised in what I feel are very privileged circumstances. I was raised by two parents, Black Americans, born and raised in D.C. themselves, successful, artistic, intelligent, um, and they, they raised me to do what I try to do with my music. Um, I perform under the name Silence Echoes. And so what that represents to me is make sure that when you have a platform, you use it. And when you need to listen, you listen. You know, that's something that we all can constantly get better at. Like Emma prompted at the beginning of this, you know, you want to listen not to respond, but to truly listen. And when it is your turn to speak, use that platform to make sure that you're being a voice for people who may or may not have a voice, you know, already. So thank you. You know, thank it's you. a privilege to be included in this. I'm Emma's drummer. I am, uh, you know, I've got some music of my own as well. So let's, uh, let's keep the good vibes going. Nice. Daniel. Hi, my name is Daniel Hill and I'm a musician in the Washington DC area for over a decade. Uh, I'm here to uh, listen and to learn how I can be part of growth and change and, and progress that I think is a long time overdue that has been promised in the past, has been written into legislation and isn't being lived on a daily basis. And so I'm, I'm really uh, like humbled uh, like to be here and just to have the conversation with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Jo. Hi, sorry about that. Our internet booted us off a second ago, but we're back. Um, I'm Mary Jo Matea. I have, um, I wear a couple of hat, a few hats. Um, in addition to being a DC area musician, um, I'm also a social scientist by training. Um, I have a doctorate in educational theory and policy and work for the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. Um, and I'm also a fitness instructor, specifically I teach Zumba. Um, so I wear a lot of hats and I interact with a lot of people, a lot of uh, people from all walks of life and am here to contribute whatever I can contribute and like Nick to listen to what I need to be listening to. Thank you. Johnny. Uh, my name is Johnny Gray. I'm from here. I, I also wear many hats. I'm, I'm an artist. I, I'm a guitar repair tech. I'm a guitarist, I'm a singer, songwriter, uh, guitar teacher. Um, I think what I would really like to learn today or hear more about today are uh, practical ways we can bring some of these uh, frequently difficult conversations uh, or, or uncomfortable conversations into our art. I feel like we are, we're storytellers and, and part of what storytellers do is uh, in, interpretation. We mm -hmm. act like interpreters um, for the world around us. And I think uh, there's a lot that we, I think that we ought to bring into our art. And I'm excited to hear, uh, to hear from everyone on this call about uh, 
ways of doing that. And thank you for letting me be here. Thank you. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, hello, my name is Emma G. I am originally from New Zealand, a singer, songwriter, full-time musician here in Washington, DC, um, coming with a whole lot of different uh, kind of baggage, but realizing more and more what it's like to be a brown person in the United States. And uh, as a result, uh, have established myself as an artist, which is an artistic activist, um, using my music to spread messages of hope and empowerment across the country and hopefully beyond. Um, so thank you guys all for joining us, um, or joining me rather on this conversation. Thank you everybody at Watch From From Home for joining in on this conversation as well. If you have any questions and you are watching from either the Capital Groove Collective uh, Facebook page or from one of the other affiliate artists who have streamed this on their page, please make sure that you um, get involved and type any feedback, comments, questions, um, because we're all in this together. And I feel like uh, one of the one of the best ways that CGC is showing up is by honoring um, the diversity of this entire collective. Uh, so I wanted to start off with, um, you know, th there have been a couple of questions that have been uh, promoted to the circles that I um, revolve in um, and to myself, but also, uh, you know, just leading up to this to this chat, um, there's a lot of people wanting to know how we're doing. Um, so whether you're a person of color or whether you are one of our lighter, brighter people, um, you know, how, how are you feeling at the moment um, and, and how are you using those emotions to show up um, in the same order, if possible, please. Ting, if you want to start us off. Sure. Um... I think how I'm feeling at the moment, well, actually, I don't, I don't think like how I'm feeling is, is as important actually as how people of color are feeling right now because they're directly affected. Um, I feel for them. I feel empathy. I feel compassion. I feel anger. Um, I feel like we are witnessing the same patterns of like the same history, like repeating itself over and over. Mm -hmm. And I just don't understand why we can't as a, you know, developed country as one of the most powerful countries in the world to be able to like resolve this together. I just don't understand why we're still in this position. Um, and, you know, I definitely want to talk to everybody and get everybody's thoughts on how we can actually move forward and what are the realistic steps we can take to actually resolve this because this cannot keep happening. Um, we have to be the example uh, for the world too because racism happens in all over the world. Um, we, ha we have always been an example for, in different aspects. Um, so I think this is something that we have to you know, resolve in this country so we can be an example for other countries as well in the world. Um, yeah, so you know, I just, I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this conversation um, because these conversations are rare to have. You know, just a group of people of different color, different backgrounds, different perspectives to come together and just talk to each other. I feel like also this country needs to talk to each other more without everybody just getting defensive and, and just defending their point of view. We have to talk and listen to each other. That's the only way we can move forward together. So, so there, there's a lot of mixed emotions right now, um, but mainly is what can we do? Like, how can we move forward? Thank you. Cody, sorry, Billy. I'm trying to get losing, losing track of myself. <clears throat> well, beloved, brother's tired. I'm the elder of everyone on this panel and I'm the eldest person in the collective. I'll be 56 years old this year. I was raised by two people that were born in the deep South, South Carolina and Georgia in 1912 and 1918. Do I know these stories? Do I know what we're living right now? Yes, because it was branded into my spirit 
by people who rode in the back of the bus and went in back doors and all the horrendous Jim Crow things in addition to this bullshit that we're talking about that's taken place in our society. Um, and yes, it's bullshit. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> the insolence, the arrogance, and the the just lack of of regard for other humans is absurd and so yeah i'm tired i'm angry some of you have kids i don't want your kids growing up in this That's how I'm feeling. Strange fruit. Let's not let it get to that, please. Um, Nick. Uh, I think from for me, uh, it's uh, I'm old enough to you know I was pretty cognizant of the LA riots in the early '90s, and it feels like to me in our society we have a problem with violence in general. This is just my perspective, but it feels like we stumble from one massacre or one violence uh, event, mass violence event to another annually, if not more frequent than that. Uh, when it's, when it's, I think for me, because I have a position of privilege in the society where I'm not directly threatened, the best I can leverage, I feel that I can best use my privilege kind of three ways. One is to constantly stay hungry to learn, to grow, to listen. Uh, another is, is, to, um, is to, when I have the opportunity to take part in conversations uh, uh, and spread information as, as now, I wanna do that. But uh, when you're in a position of privilege, you are not hunted. I'm not hunted, ever. Hmm. And that means that I can sit in an armchair and I can reflect without stress. That's part of privilege. And one of the things I can do is I can use that, that I, and I try and do that is when I look at uh, Minneapolis and I see uh, that there are people coming in from outside the city that are actually exacerbating the problems that have nothing to do with, with a genuine, peaceful, real, grounded, necessary protest. I can sit back and I can try and think like a surgeon, how to handle, how to parse out this problem and solve that problem and solve this problem and solve that problem. That's one of the advantages that privilege gives me. So I guess for me, where I'm feeling is that I'm trying to not misstep, not talk too much, uh, but also kind of be aware of where I should use my voice and use my platform as Joey's talking about. And one of the privileges I have is I can sit back and I can think and I can use my education. I can use my lack of stress, my lack of being preyed upon daily to use that space, that safe space that I occupy all the time, pretty much from that place of safety to kind of look out into the world and go, okay, I'm not threatened. I'm calm. I can see that problem super clearly because it's not in my face, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephanie. Hey, um, so this, this week has been um, interesting. You know, when I first heard about George Floyd and I, um, my first reaction, I'm going to be really honest. My first reaction was like, oh man, like, I don't want to deal with this right now. Like I'm, I've been going through, you know, a lot with my mental health, with quarantine and, and all the things and, and trying really hard to take care of myself. And that was my first thought. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> my, my thought was, you know, like, this is, this is, you know, um, like, you could, you could either just focus on yourself and ignore everything that's going on or use this as an opportunity to come outside of yourself and um, help people that are hurting. Um, and the the other thought that, and, and the thing is like with what, what you all and what um, a lot of my African-American friends are asking for is really uh, not, that much to ask. It's all that, well, if I understand correctly, I mean, that's why we're here. I'm asking like, what what, what should we do? But 
from what I've been hearing, it sounds like things that you're asking for aren't hard things to do. And so, um, yeah, I'm just, I I'm, was like really happy when Jero and Emma put this um, together because yeah. Um, so one last thought um, is that today I saw a friend uh, post a picture of her son turned five and he, uh, and he, you know, they're African-American. I saw this cute little boy and I'm thinking, it, is mom scared right now? <laughs> and that really got me um, feeling all the emotions. So I just want to make the future better. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Cody. How do I feel right now? It's a, um, it's a great question. It's broad for me because there are a wide range of emotions happening in me right now. Mm -hmm. um, on March 15th, um, that Sunday, that COVID really like hit when it became a, like readily abundantly clear that life is about yeah. to change and we started quarantining in place, I moved. I had, I moved into a new house um, and it was a challenge of a move. It was the easiest move that I've done, but it was still a challenge because people were dropping out, but the people that I needed to be there were there. And ever since I've had nothing but space to just kind of reflect and like financially I'm good, um, energy wise I'm good. I got tons of space, I got everything that I need. It's like, if I need something, it shows up. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible how quickly it shows up. I'm, I'm good in that regard. But and when I look outside and I see what's happening, um, the way I feel is, um, I feel, I feel like I don't want to get in the way of life. I feel like a lot of people for a very long time have had the privilege to not do anything. And that privilege is turning around and it's choking them. <laughs> um, so it just feels like all this inaction is kind of finally, it's finally manifesting. And I don't know what life is doing right now. I don't know the path. I know that I'm blessed. I know life wants me to be blessed and I'm happy about that. I know that it's going to get a lot worse and it gets better. Um, and I, I know that, I know that if, if you want to survive in the coming times, you need to do the work of finding your internal biases, always questioning them. Um, and that, I mean, that's the kind of work that I've done for years. And it kind of seems, it seems that's the only way forward now. Um, Cause if you don't do that work, you're going to get left behind. Um, you're, you, you won't make it. Thank you. Um, Olio. Uh, hello. So I've been asked like how I'm doing or how I think, and it's, weird because part of me is just like well it didn't happen to me so I'm like away from it but part of me is also like but it did happen to you and like it's I've become kind of numb to it in a way because it's like every time something like this happens I'm like oh my gosh again 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 and it's like well how does it keep happening again of course it's a rhetorical question I know how it's easy to look at someone and murder them in front of a force of people when you don't see that, that person as a person, you know? And that is really what the issue is, is reminding people that Black people are people. And so hmm. overall, just like, like as a, as a, African-American woman, I'm tired, like Billy. And as a, just a, and as an African-American woman, I'm also just like, 
like I shouldn't have to, like I speak out, like my existence is this. Um, and sometimes when I'm asked about like, well, what can I do? And I'm like, read a book. You can Google, <laughs> you can figure out, like you can do some of the work on your own to figure out how some of this stuff has come to be without me having to explain it to you because that's like trying to retell my entire life story every single time someone wants to know why Black Lives Matter. And it's like, <laughs> like do some of the work, like besides the fact that Black women play a role of being the emotional mule of, <laughs> of a lot of situations, um, it also is just like, <laughs> so like it, there's, there's not a lot of words for how I'm doing, but I do not want to be silent. I don't have that privilege to be silent. Um, I can't just, you know, turn it off and look away and not have it affect me because it does. Thank you for sharing. Joey. Just want to uh, bookend what you said, Solia, because I thought that was really great. Um, so a statistic that I recently discovered a few months ago is that Black women are also the, you know, proportionately the most highly educated demographic in America. And so thanks. Thank you for being that emotional mule. Um, I am. Uh, I gave these questions a good amount of thought ahead of time, but I didn't write anything down. So I actually just uh, just wrote down a couple of things to make sure I'm respecting that time. Right now, I'm feeling bombarded, but motivated because of my community. A little overwhelmed and a lot up to the challenge of discovering and enacting what I can do. Um, as far as what I can do as a person of privilege, because I do have privilege, I've got male privilege, I've got, you know, class privilege, and I want to make sure that when I get an opportunity to speak, I'm giving space for, you know, my female companions to have their peace, to have their space to talk, um, and we're not silencing them. And I've also got what I kind of just like right now realize is a little bit of black privilege because, and I'm not saying that you know, the black struggle isn't one of the most significant struggles that made America a thing. Um, but it seems a little bit currently to be eclipsing the struggle of other people of color. And so I want to make sure that I don't silence the voices that are not just black Americans. Um, I want our actions to help illuminate the struggles of Asian, Latin, Indian, especially Native Americans, um, as well as any and all people who get the short stick in business, you know. You know, all that all that kind of stuff people whose presence seems to reduce the value of real estate um, this community the community the, the capital groove collective is doing one of the best things I think that we can do which is to give everyone a voice our light and bright friends which I really like because I've got a lot of friends who are comfortably and vocally not white but white passing um, are very conscientious and desiring of change as well and so as far as staying is your, in your lane I've been reminded by my father growing up that uh, black people wouldn't be citizens or have any rights if it wasn't for good white people in the past. And so it's important not to remain silent. It's important to use your platform to say, hey, you know, this is how I feel. This is what I think. This is what this person thinks and feels. They matter too. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Daniel. I feel overwhelmed, to be honest with you. Um, very conflicted um, as a white male. Um, I, I feel like um, I feel personally responsible. I feel socially responsible. I feel um, I feel in, in many ways just uh, class responsible and, and things that are reflected in, in previous speakers. I feel like um, I want to like I want to go to war over it, but I want I want the end to be a, a resolution. I'd like to be working towards an end that that satisfies the need, just the real legitimate need. Um, and I'm also feeling like uh, as uh, as a father of a 10 year old, I, I, 
I, I must do something. I must, um, but I'm not able to go to war the way that others are. And I have single friends who are, who are my age with no kids who are out and peacefully protesting and, uh, and have the ability to, and, and can, can get out there and go back. And I'm, I'm proud of them and I want to be there and support them, but I'm not able to be. And so these are kinds of just some experiences that I have and how I feel. Um, what I can, what I can do is again, just try to put myself in a position to say, like, I think we need real solutions and I'd like to be working towards them. And if, there. if, if there's going to be a successful resolution on how people can come together to do great things in spite of any, uh, like visual aesthetic, I think our group is a great example of that. Thank you. Um, before we go to Mary Jo and Johnny, I need to apologize to Jero. I didn't give him an opportunity to introduce himself. So if it's okay, I'm going to let you um, answer this question and also introduce yourself, Jero. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jero Williams. I am a vocalist, recording artist, actor in the D.C. area, originally from Alexandria, Virginia. Um, proud graduate of Alexandria City Public Schools, T.C. Williams High School, one of the most diverse schools in the entire region. I'm a proud graduate of Virginia Tech, go Hokies. Um, so with all of that being said, as a black man living in America, I have been very fortunate to have a lot of opportunities to excel and to be the best person that I can possibly be. But with all that being said, it still doesn't make sense to me how I have to go outside of my house every day with an invisible target on my back just because of a pigment. That, doesn't, that, that still doesn't compute to me. You know, every one of us, we come into this world knowing nothing. We only know what has been given to us by the environments that we have come up in. And at some point, there has to be some connection for us to look and say, hmm, something about this doesn't feel right. Because all I know is I see this person next to me. They may have some similarities. They may have some differences to me. Um, but they're still a person who has thoughts and feelings and families. So when I see these injustices happening day in, day out, and the way that they're happening, um, a few of you probably saw my Facebook posts and my Instagram posts over the past couple of days and where I asked this simple question, will I be next? Mm -hmm. And that for me is a very serious and scary question that I have to ask myself before I even step out of my house to go live my life the best way that I know how. Um, but also with that, I have a very strong faith and I am very optimistic in a lot of things. And I try to do everything I can to see the best in people. And so even with all of these riots and all of the you know tweets and all of the reactions, all I can do is sit here and say, what can I do to bring value, not just to people who look like me, but the people who don't look like me that are trying to figure out where do we go from here. And I think by us having this type of discussion and us even just sparking this and starting this, this is what needs to be done because reacting to a, a, a post on social media is not the answer. That's just one thing, but it's not until we all get together, whether it's a in face-to-face -face or a virtual room and really figure out what everybody is thinking and what everybody is going through because that's how we heal by understanding each other. So I'm, I'm very happy that everybody was able to be a part of this and come on to this so that, you know, like I said, we can just, we can connect and uh, figure out how's, how we as humans and, and we as creatives can use what we have and our God-given talents to, um, to heal, make sense of this. Thank you. Mary Jo. Um, I'm going to echo what a few other people have said, which is that um, I'm overwhelmed. I'm perplexed. I'm um, frustrated. I, I have a very similar response to what's happening right now to the response that I have whenever we hear about another mass shooting in a school, which is how is this still a thing? Um, and it is, I, I, I mean, I, I am literally without words, like as far as just, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what 
to contribute. Um, I do know that it is absurd and can't continue um, that we live in a country that is wealthy and prosperous because of black Americans and the fact that black Americans have targets on their backs is just overwhelming, perplexing and frustrating and angering and all of those adjectives and um, yeah, just overwhelmed. Thank you. Johnny. Um, I feel a lot of things too. I, I wasn't uh, going to do a show and tell until um, until I, I just Mary Jo just reminded me of something. Um, this is a, a cotton bowl from a uh, from the front yard of a plantation house that was owned by my great 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 grandfather, um, and I I experience uh, some level of shame um, and have experienced shame for for a lot of my life, knowing that my my family was directly involved in subjugation and systematic dehumanization of, uh, of black Americans. Um, and I also understand that the, that my ability to feel shame is, is a, a byproduct of my privilege. Um, right now, I feel, uh, proud of the protests that are happening. I feel, uh, a, I'm, I'm very glad to see action and to see people on the streets and to see mobilization. I'm, very afraid of what might happen if uh, a member of the National Guard or a member of a police department is injured or killed. Um, I am I'm disgusted by the hubris of many people in this city, especially. It's right. it's difficult it's difficult to see um, marchers and protesters going right by people that are having brunch, being served by almost exclusively uh, a staff made up of, of uh, people of color. But I'm also optimistic, um, very cautiously optimistic, just because we're having this discussion right now, because I, I think other discussions like this are happening all over the country and hopefully all over the world. I saw a train car in Belgium that was uh, painted with the words, I can't breathe. So if this movement makes it across the Atlantic, that, that's a, a bit of good news. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing um, a little bit about who you are and where you're coming from. I'm super um, conscious of the time and we've got a lot of questions that have been brought to our attention um, about what we can, you know, uh, how, how we can contribute to the conversation in a, in a uplifting, positive, and action-giving uh, way. Um, I, and I say that to preface that there is every possibility that we're going to have to have another one of these um, soon. So I want to dig into the questions super quickly. Um, I'm not going to give everybody the opportunity to like pick on everyone to, to respond, because some of you may not want to respond. Some of you may just want to shut up and listen, and that is OK. If you want to listen, that's great. If you want to talk, please, uh, all I ask is that you respect each other's two minutes and uh, we get through everything with civility and love. Um, so we've all talked about how we've all got, uh, we all come from some kind of privilege. Um, but one of the questions I was asked was, uh, what can I do as a person of privilege? Who would like to start that? What can you do as a person of privilege? You can, you can denounce racism. You can use your platform and your privilege to check your family, friends, colleagues, lovers, whatever, and just denounce racism. Mm -hmm. We're not in a place, and Angela Davis said this, I'm going to grossly quote this and then I'll shut up. You can't be anti-racism. Well, you can't, you can't be, I'm not a racist. You got to be anti-racism. Mm -hmm. There's no straddling the fence. There's no, you know, uh, what's the word say? You can't be lukewarm. You got you to be hot or cold. Mm -hmm. 
you know um so that that's where that lies you know and there's i mean if a person that's really got that level of privilege there's so many ways they can do it i mean you can do it artistically you can just sit down and and scratch punch your fingers out on facebook and say what you got to say and let the world know that you ain't feeling this thank you strongly agree billy you know a lot everybody here who's on this call is an artist in some way shape or form and so we have a platform you know it's important that we utilize that in these times um i know i'm doing my best sometimes it's tough though like you can be overwhelmed and that can contribute to an anxiety induced writer's block but um uh you know the, just to say that you're trying is still way beyond nothing um that said um for a lot of people who make a career out of art money isn't always there and so for the people who have money but don't have you know a platform as artists you can donate and you can be really vocal about a donation no matter how small you don't have to tell people how much you donate you can donate ten dollars one dollar and you can say i did this this is something that i think you know you can call you can you know uh one one friend called me today just to just to vent a little bit and she was, we were talking about ways to protest safely. And she said that she had experienced people driving around, people who were afraid of, you know, contracting COVID-19, um, driving around with signs in their car. And I thought that was a really creative solution to uh, wanting to be a part of, you know, public demonstration against injustice, but, you know, maintaining social distance in a way that makes you feel okay so there's a lot of different ways creative ways and conversations like this are going to lead to more solutions that no one no one can think of all of them so mm -hmm. continuing to make sure that you're vocal is actually the most important thing because you're going to get a response and you're going to elicit more responses whether they come yeah. to you or not thank you well as um as a person of not a lot of privileges, because I am an immigrant minority woman, um, Asian, um, I do still feel like I have some privileges that I can use. Um, you know, uh, something I wanted to suggest is, well, I'm personally involved, you know, there's like a lot of online platforms that, um, you know, do petitions and they gather signatures. Um, I'm part of like Global Citizen, where we do this almost on a daily basis for the world. Um, on different issues, whether it's poverty, racism, sexism, um, but that's more around the world. Um, but there's another organization called change.org, which I recently uh, learned about and got involved with. And this, I believe this is a website where people can start petitions and get signatures and then they deliver to um, legislators, like lawmakers, and actually like make change, you know, have people call them directly, have people sign, um, have the, their voices heard. So there are a lot of like, I would say like, you know, I'm going to continue to join a lot of online um, activist platforms to do, you know, what I can to um, bring light to a lot of these issues, but also take real action and contribute to something that will lead to change and lead to action. Um, but other than that, I think a lot of you have said it's, it's about having conversations. It's about checking uh, family, friends, checking yourself, checking your own. Uh, racial bias because I sometimes do find myself having those as well. Um, you know, just continually continue to be better person and then check everyone else to make sure they're better people and slowly, hopefully that can um, have a ripple effect and, you know, and really make real change. And I'm also part of a family that is white American. Uh, my step family is white American, a lot of them live in the South, um, North Carolina. And so, you know, I think it's also important for me to have conversations with them or start the conversations because a lot of times they're not the ones to start the conversations to kind of like check them too, you know, because a lot of times they try to avoid certain things. But I think it, now is not the time to be avoiding conversations. Now is the time to be like, hey, we have to talk about this. We're in America, we're not in white America. so. Like, can we, can we like get on the same page on some of these things? So, yeah, Ting, I want to, I want to just piggyback off what you're saying because you you bring up a very, you, you brought up a very important thing. It, it's really all about just 
being letting people know that it's okay to have the conversation because a lot of us are going to approach this from very emotional sides and i know cody had a had a story he wanted to share from like his walks of life like everybody's handling this in different ways but i think the important thing is if we're open to at least having the conversation and also being prepared for both effects meaning like as much as we want this to be a kumbaya event not everybody is going to be hip to that and there's going to be some people that are just going to push it down no matter how many times you try to give your viewpoint so it's again showing that love for that person and respecting their views but also be let them know hey my door is open to you if you need a safe space to talk about what you're feeling and things that you're trying to understand so thank you for bringing that up about simply just having the conversation right thank you um so and that's a great segue i i know that uh Joe, you just mentioned that Cody's got a story. Did you want to share your story, Cody? Oh, yes, yes. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Jero and Emma. And um, yeah, y'all all bring up really incredible points. And to add to that last one, I would say if you're a person of privilege in America um, and you're American, find out about your history. Um, Johnny, I applaud you for looking back. Um, I think you need to find out about your history. You need to find out what's there, what, you know, like who did what, what families have been maybe trampled over um, and also find a way to heal the energy because it's been passed down to you. It is cowardice that has been passed down to you as a gift wrapped in really shiny, beautiful packaging. <laughs> you know, they sold you cowardice. <laughs> um, so there's, okay, um, I will tell my story. It kind of goes with the next question, which is, um, what would you say to people who want to stay in your lane? And also with the last question, which is, why is it so hard to show up for each other? Mm. Um, I'm a Black musician here in DC. I, I started playing shows in 2012. Um, I got involved with this organization called Flash Band, but the first, the first time that I did it, it was real, it was real small. Um, it was the very first one that they'd ever done. And it was just like an email list. It wasn't on anything like social media wise. Um, and we got together, like that show happened and it was awesome. And I shined and the person that was behind it reached out to me and said, help me, help me do these. And after about three years, um, in, in three years time, I was the only person doing events and also organizing them and also hosting them. Sometimes I would also run sound. Sometimes I would also perform in them. Um, during the meet and greets, I was there. My energy, my energy was the energy that was pushing it along. Um, and so, so much was born out of that, but I was fired when I recognized that I was the only person of color involved. There were four people and the other three people, they were white, they weren't doing nearly as much work as I was and they owned everything 33%. I asked for maybe 5% and he fired me. And do you know what people did in the community? One or two people were like, oh, Cody, it sucks that you, you don't work for them anymore. But they, stopped, they kept going. Um, at the time, the company also had got a seed funding, like $300,000. They couldn't do the events the way that I did them. And they went out of business and lost the funding six months later. Um, no one really showed up. Very few people actually recognized the racist shit that happened there. And from that. But whatever, I, I kept going. I had a band, this band, All the Best Kids, and I, I kept it going. I, I pushed it. We did all this beautiful love music, and I started doing some real dope shit. But I, I would still experience racist shit. Like, I had a drummer that, when I wasn't around, he thought it was cool to say what's up in words to everybody else. Yeah, that's real. He didn't think I was there, but I saw him, and I was like, dude, what the fuck is your problem? Nobody else there said anything. And you know what? They were all white. 
I <laughs> somehow became a black man, the only black man in an all white band leading it. There were resentments that came up. I saw some, I saw some real shit, <laughs> but I still led that motherfucker. Um, I'm sorry for the cursing. I'll, I'll try you're to not, cut it back, but yeah, it's reality. Multiple, multiple things. Like I, I could, I could count off multiple things, but this is one instance in particular where nobody, no one spoke up. Nobody. I had to say it. I had to fire him from the band. <laughs> but whatever. Whatever. I kept it going because I believed, right? And I know that the things that I've done in the city, I've helped grow. There's so many communities that exist because of the work that I put in. <laughs> and I know it. I, I see it. I see the offshoots. I see, I see the, the energy. Some people know the things that I've done in this community. Um, I've told you two examples of people not showing up. There's a third. It happened about a year ago. Um, there was somebody that I at one time had dated, but when I started bringing up racist things that they would do, they got angry with me. They would get very angry. And when it became abundantly clear that I couldn't deal with it anymore, they left. About a year ago, they asked me for money and I told them no. They made up lies. <laughs> they said, this person harasses me, he makes up fake profiles, said all kinds of, all kinds of lies about me. And do you know what the community did? Maybe a few people stood up. A few people were there. Emma was one of the people that were there. The vast majority of people turned their backs. All the people that were there feeding off of my energy, all the people that were there, all those eight years that had held on to what I gave them, turned their backs. They started saying, I, I don't want to be involved. If they said anything, the vast majority of them didn't say a word. And do you know, I had to deal with it. I just, I had to shoulder that. Um, I had people in my corner that supported me, that remembered the light that I am. And I thank God for them because it got really dark that past year. Hmm. And the only thing that really, really helped me was this. <laughs> hmm. and this might be backwards to you, but it's no, black. It. No, Y'all see it's it? Plain, bro. It's plain. This is a it book. Is. This is a book written by two black psychologists in the 60s. In the 60s. <laughs> Can you imagine the things that this book holds? Mm -hmm. This is the only thing that kept me sane. <laughs> um, so what I see now, I see hypocrites. I see people posting things, right? They say, oh my God, it's so... Uh, this is so bad. Oh, I can't believe that woman called the cops on that, that dude just for telling her. But you know what? When that woman made up all those lies about me, she had no evidence, zero evidence. And nobody confronted her about it. Not one fucking person. <laughs> this is why you don't show up. This is why you're dealing with this. Because in your communities, there's people like me who have dealt with all of this for years and years, and you say, I'm not gonna get involved. Well, that I'm not gonna get involved is tripping you now. You're tied to it. You're caught by it. <laughs> That's real, bro. Yeah, um, I'm gonna jump off of Cody and that what happens when, especially, okay, so I have, my experience growing up is being in the minority is growing up in a school system and classrooms and going to a predominantly white institution for university is that um, when you are the only black person in the room and you call out the racism that you see and you feel and you know and the other people don't see it, it feels like gaslighting because that's what it is. And yeah. so if you, and to draw uh, um, analogies to like the Me Too movement and, and, and victimization of, 
of, you know, not of rape victims and why they don't come forward. What happens when you are the only black person in the room or one of two or one of few is that when you, when you draw attention to these experiences and you try to tell people, oh, this is what's happening. This is racist and this is why it's racist. They're like, but I've always said it. Or uh, you're taking it too seriously or, oh, you're pulling the race card. And those things are not helpful. Um, but I think we have some audience questions that I want to jump into really quickly. Uh, first one is, it's my contention that money drives policy in America. How do we exert sufficient control over the money to impact policy. And as a Black person who knows that the Black dollar is worth so much money, put your money where your mouth is. Invest in Black companies. Buy from Black businesses. Um, one of the things that uh, your, your dollars um, go towards funding the local police forces. And I'm not saying that we need to scrap the police. But if you know the history of the police, that's a totally different topic for a totally different day. But knowing that that is what happens and that the training that goes into training these policemen who are then going out into the street and not addressing their inherent biases and not addressing those things, none of that gets addressed. They are trained to escalate situations. And in that, it doesn't... Um, it, it, you get things, you get George Floyd. And what you can do is, is in those policies is demanding by voting, by putting your money where your mouth is, you know, we need better training for our officers. We need to, them, we need sensitivity training. We need cultural training. We need to teach them how to de-escalate situations. It doesn't have to reach that point. It should never, it shouldn't have to reach that point because other countries and other professions within America are in similar situations, similar life-threatening situations without resulting in the body count that um, being a police officer has resulted in in this country. Um, so that's one question. Um, another question we got from the audience is- Sorry, Tolia, I actually wanted to just- Oh yeah, sorry. Go for it. Mention the um, uh, significance of what you just said, because there are a lot of uh, martial arts experts that actually teach self-defense to the police. And one of them is a friend of mine named DJ Stevens. And he recently uh, filmed a video that I'm going to be posting this evening. I meant to post it earlier, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, I had my head in the right space for this. Um, and, you know, write, write the right caption, but I'm going to be posting a video that he recorded. Um, and I would love for everybody to share it around. He is somebody who trains police officers in self-defense. He teaches Krav Maga at an institution called Krav Maga CDK. And, um, you know, he has a lot to say about the police needing to be policed. Uh, so I'm going to be posting up that video. And if anybody wants to look up uh, DJ Stevens at Krav Maga CD. I didn't know he was your friend. I saw that video. Yeah, oh, good. I'm glad. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm going to be yeah. sharing it around. Um, yeah. yeah. It was also powerful. in the music video. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> it's, it's, Sorry powerful. <laughs> it's powerful. There were a couple of times where I thought he was going to end. It was a little stream of consciousness, but he had a lot of incredibly articulate thoughts. And I'm glad that he took his, he took his piece, man. It, it, like every single word held a lot of weight. Um, and so that just relates to what you were saying. You know, that's just something that I want to get some, uh, some momentum behind it because it it is he's an expert in exactly what you were just talking about. Let's uh, let's answer that next question. Sorry, before, before we go on to the next question, um, to add to Solia's point, somebody from the audience who's watching this at the moment also um, put forward the question of is your workplace diverse? That is a great way to to help um, elevate this conversation even further is, is maintaining that your social circles and your workplace circles um, you know are diverse circles and again it's one of the reasons why I love the Capital Groove Collective you guys keep me humble and keep me sane. Um, Mary Jo you had a point that you wanted to to uh, answer next or was it in relation to the question? Yeah yeah in relation to the question um i know the question was about money specifically um but there is also something 
that speaks very loudly that everyone can do, which is to vote. Mm. And that it does not just apply to the presidential election, which I'm sure everyone who's watching this recognizes is immensely important, but it also applies to all of the down ballot races in your local communities. And that is something that you can do. And I think I encourage everyone to get a mail-in ballot so that there is no excuse here. Um, I sent my mail-in ballot for the DC uh, primary elections in weeks ago um, and everyone all over the country should be, I mean, I might be speaking out of turn here when I say all over the country, but hopefully all over the country should be allowed to get a mail-in ballot um, so that regardless of- Send my mail-in ballot for the DC uh, primary. Uh, so um, I'm sorry, I just heard an echo. Um, so you should be able to get the mail-in ballot uh, and be able to vote regardless of where you are, regardless of what the COVID situation is at that period in time. And that I think is something that, I mean, I know it's not money specific, but is very important and that we all can do regardless of what our financial situation is. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I think um, that Cody Valentine wanted to say something next in response oh, to the question. Cody? I is he there? He's, he's, he stepped away. Can you guys hear me? Yes, I'm back. What you got, there? Cody? I'm back. Um, so this isn't necessarily to the question. It is just to bring finality to the story uh, because I, I don't feel like there was okay. that um, in actual items as well. Um, the question was, how do you how do you stand up, right? Like, how do you show up for people? And the, the, the answer is you show up in your community, mm. look for the racist interactions, the potential. Um, I am one of mil millions, mm -hmm. probably, I don't know how many black men have had my experience or similar experiences, but the vast majority, I don't think have had my emotional capacity or have tapped into it as much as I have to process it, the vast majority are still, they still think they did something wrong. Mm. Um, so if you wanna show up, find the people that are doing racist shit. If you see a white woman saying something threatening about a black man, you need to question her. You need to, if you see a situation where somebody is like a black person is excommunicated from a group and you only hear the group's narrative, that safe narrative of all the white people who wanna feel comfortable, you're going to miss the truth of the story. You hmm. will miss it. Oh man. Thank um, so yeah. Thank you so much, Cody. That is definitely, um, that's definitely a narrative that I feel like too many black men I think Billy. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to say this, uh, piggybacking on on what Emma said earlier. Mm -hmm. When you look, when you make a new friend on social media, look at who their friends are. Mm. Yeah. Before you step into that big pile of steaming <laughs> potential, <laughs> look and see who their friends are. If you meet. I'm 55 years old now. I know y'all tired of hearing me say it, but if at, from my age down to whoever the youngest person is here, probably me. we live in a metropolis. <laughs> yes, yeah, probably Jero. It is Jero, actually. We oh. live in a metropolis. <laughs> you have no business. You have no business like not having a diverse community around you, being part of a diverse community. There's no reason for that. And when you find that, you, you really want to, my may want to explore how you want to be friends with this person and, or how much you want to be friends with this person. And also look at what they're writing on their wall, because if they're writing certain things on their wall, mm -hmm. looks like a duck. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, you don't know me. I'll yeah. go. <laughs> Side note: I am actually the youngest person here right now. But that's oh my bad. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I appreciate the comment, bro. That is all. You're all your skin, baby smooth. You're gonna live forever. Hey. Okay. Um, another audience question. <laughs> um, what are th- what are your thoughts on people whose response to the blatant attacks on black people specifically at this moment in the wake of George Floyd is that all lives matter and or not all white people, etc. cetera. Um, I feel this is a straw man argument meant to deflect from the pertinent issues. I think we need to face issues even when they're difficult head on and with empathy. So that was a second audience question that we had. And I'm going to say that you're right. It is meant to detract. And I'm going to tell you that this conversation is not about you, anyone being comfortable in what, any way whatsoever. Because the fact that we are comfortable is the reason why this is happening. Is because people who, people are able to, like, it, it, I, can't, I can't comprehend that three other human beings stood by while a person was murdered by someone else and said nothing and did nothing like that that right there is being comfortable and what needs to happen is people need to be uncomfortable for things to get to change in any way whatsoever so like the whole point of black lives matter is not saying that only black lives matter it is black lives matter too as well so anyone who says um, all lives matter or my favorite is that blue lives matter blue lives is not a is not a thing I don't care what anyone says you chose to be a police officer I did not choose to be born black, up black. or that's, smart that's, 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 like a, that's a that's a dog whistle that's a that it, blue lives matter a topic I understand but I definitely like I acknowledge the so yeah carry on uh, the a few people have have talked over each other. So, so oh, like, okay. thought, and then we'll move over to Billy and then Johnny. I think yeah, Johnny sounds like he has something to say. But like, I understand that you know becoming a police officer is a a serious profession. I understand the inherent danger of being a police police officer. But at the end of the day, if it came down to your life, you can walk away from being a police officer. I cannot walk away from my skin color. So that is why I say that you cannot just throw out blue lives matter. You know, it'll it'll I it it just can't happen. You cannot equate the two. So when you hear something like all lives matter or not all white people. It's like, we're not saying all white people, but enough white people are complacent. Enough white people have done nothing or said nothing Mm -hmm. that this stuff keeps happening. And it's, 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 it's exhausting. It's like, how many more times can we say that we matter too? You know, we've been saying we matter too for the past 200 plus years. Like there's no, there's no other many ways to say that black people are people too. And that's why when people are like, well, you know, they're causing their riots and there's violence. It's not the answer. The answer is whatever is going to get hurt. Cause the Boston Tea Party was a riot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Johnny, can we, we, we? You had a response, Johnny. I think um, we also need to be very be wary of um, speaking mostly to the to the lighter and brighter uh, that might be watching and listening. Um, things like all lives matter and blue lives matter are uh, what are referred to as dog whistles. And it's something that's, it's like the term tough on crime and what that specifically means. I remember hearing that term a whole lot when I I was growing up in the late 90s and early 2000s about uh, political candidates being tough on crime and and what that specifically entails. Um, They are, they sound innocuous and they sound non-threatening and non-harmful, but they are very, they're very much uh, one-sided they are very much polarizing comments. Um, and that's, I, I think, uh, as, as far as how to confront that, um, I, don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for that right now. I, I can tell you that at one of the protests yesterday, I, I believe it was in, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, there was a gentleman who 
got out of his car with a bow and arrow mm -hmm. uh, and, and yelled all lives matter before firing into uh, a crowd of onlookers. So I, I think um, as, as artists, as, as, uh, or as, as Emma likes to call us artivists, um, I think uh, we have a good chance to be uh, creative in how we confront this. That's all I want to say. Yeah, I just want to, I just want to build on that. Johnny, thank you for saying that too, by the way, because number one, how ironic is that, that you're coming out of your car with a bow and arrow saying all lives matter and you're shooting a weapon at people. And number two, I didn't know that the Hunger Games was becoming a real thing. So, um, you know, we all want to be Katniss Everdeen at some point. So I, it, that didn't make sense to me. I did see that, but I, I did want to build also off of this whole talk of all lives matter because we do hear that a lot. And I will admit me personally that I do bring that into my arguments, but I bring it in because of the bridge and it's because of the bridge that Solia mentioned when she said that we're not saying when we say black lives matter that it's only black lives matter. We're saying black lives matter too, in addition to your life, this person's life, this person's life, all those other things. So when I do tell people that, yes, I understand what you're saying in saying that all lives matter, but that is not the, that is not the initial basis of what we're talking about. We're talking about why is it that a man is out jogging and even though he may look like a suspect, why is he gunned down instead of taking the proper channels to follow and tail this person and call the proper authorities and then have it worked out through due process. Right now that's happening to black people, not to anybody else. And I don't wanna keep making this a black versus white issue. But what I'm bringing to this is it's situations like that where we try to tell people, this is not just a race issue. This is a, a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. So when we say those terms, all lives matter, recognize that you're putting, you're putting all phases into that, but also recognize this is a human rights issue. Put yourself in that person's position who was oppressed against. How would you feel if something like that happened to you or somebody that you knew? So if we put that on people like that in a, in a, in a opening way, I think also because tone has a lot to do with it and how we, you know, engage these conversations. If you put it on them like that, it does change the tone somewhat. So I, I just wanted to build off of what you were saying about that term and how I do use it, but also as a bridge based on the original thing. Because lastly, before I send it to somebody else, what we also notice too is that when people are talking about the riots, everybody's talking about the what in the moment without talking about the why, because we wouldn't have these riots if another person of color were not so viciously oppressed against. We have to keep remembering that when these sort of things happen, there is a why to why everything happens. And if we're not analyzing the why, then of course, everybody's going to be extreme about the what. So I'm just going to, that's, that's where I want to leave that. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, now, I'm also very, again, I'm conscious of the time, um, and I know that Joey um, has something to contribute next. Um, and there are a number of questions that are coming through, um, one of which is, keep looking for the bigger picture. This is about global human oppression, which I think, Jerome, you started to touch on a little bit, that looking, looking from a global perspective is really important. And because of all these questions that are being asked and, um, you know, that we haven't got time to... Uh, you know, address right now, please keep an eye on the Capital Group Collective events. Uh, we will be running a second follow up to this and possibly a third because these are important conversations that we need to keep having. And again, I, I just want to pay tribute uh, that I'm very blessed that the, the Capital Group Collective uh, initiative um, is filled with artivistic and compassionate and wonderful humans who give a flying fuck. Um, and there's so many of us around the world here in DC, Maryland and Virginia, who are showing up and 
uh, as appreciators of our music, you are part of this conversation. You can help by listening to us, by being part of us, and by sharing these um, these messages of communication, connection, hope, empowerment, and strength. Um, Joey, what were you wanting to add, my friend? Are you saying Billy or Joey? Joey, uh, okay. or either or. If Billy, if you were you wanting to say something as well. I think you might have misinterpreted. I was um I had a little hand up on my screen because I was offering applause. Oh, okay, so it was. Thank you, cool. my friend. Um, so uh, the 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 Black Lives Matter counter point that all lives matter and blue lives matter. That is a uh, like 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 Johnny was saying. You know, that's those 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 are dog whistles. That stuff goes back to the Southern strategies, and they create created a totally entire vernacular on the way that they could present things and not be blunt and it would always pass through as policy and law so whenever these atrocities take place that we've been dealing with for what like 20 years now you want to oppress me then you want to tell me how i can react to it that's what we're dealing with here and that's the reason that these protests and demonstrations end up a little, a little, a little wild outside of the fact that you got folks now infiltrating, you know? And I mean, every time you catch one of those, you need to just give them what for, <laughs> you know? And I, and I don't condone violence in any way, shape or form, but if you're gonna come and stand beside me and pass gas and then blame it on me, <laughs> I, I got a problem with you. <laughs> And that's basically what's happening, you know? And uh, so with all that being said, you know, don't let them control the narrative. That's why Emma pulled us all together today is we don't wanna let the oppressors control the narrative on how America responds. And we as artists, like I've always said, we have a divine and defined resp responsibility to, you know, give it back and give it back right. Hey, I'm sorry, real quick. I just want to add on real quick to what Billy said, um, because th this, like this bigger point that I hope and was going to get across tonight, too, is that look at this circle right now of, of all of us. And I apologize, I just went out for a second. But look at all this circle of us. We're all creatives. We're all musicians. Not everybody has to be out in the street protesting to make your voice heard. We have a very great gift in that we can relay our messages through song mm. and through like inspiration. And so that's one thing that I'm always trying to lean on is like, how can I use the music? How can I use my voice vocally to get my message across? And each of you in this circle has something special that you can bring to this table because no matter what the climate is in the world, whether it's World War II or the Vietnam War or it's AIDS or it's the Holocaust or 9-11, whatever that climactic thing is that has been happening, what has been one of the most consistent things that has gotten us through? Music. So mm -hmm. never forget that. So each of you has a gift that you can be working on even if you don't feel uh compelled or you don't feel comfortable to be out in the street protesting with a sign you have a sign it's your music Word. so i tell people all the time my my success is my protest so just keep Brief, that yeah. stuff in mind to, when you guys are writing and when you guys are doing these certain things because that can relay far wider than once this this protest period is over the stuff that we create right now will resonate for days and years to come. I want to leave with a quote, if that's okay. Um, just why everyone should use whatever platform they have, music, um, their voice, their privilege, whatever you have. It's my favorite quote from Zora Neale Hurston in that um, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. And that is why we cannot afford to be silent. We must always use our voices as our artivists to make sure that um, we 
we can make that change because especially like I said as a black woman the the position that I sit in and the certain nuances of my experience within the black experience this quote really speaks to me but like I can't be quiet I can't be quiet I can't be silent I can I don't apologize I said what I said um and I'm not here to make you comfortable. I'm here to make sure that you understand that this is important and this is serious. And, um, you know, yeah. use your voice. Thank you. Um, and thank you again, everybody who's tuned in tonight uh, for this Real Talk special. Um, again, there are a number of questions and points that uh, were asked and that I know that members of the Capital Group Collective want to have covered, but we did not get a chance to do so. Um, so again, please keep an eye on our events. We will be rescheduling, well, we will be scheduling a follow-up event similar to this. Um, if you want to discuss things further, please visit our website and fill out the contact us form. It is capital with an O groovecollective.com. Um, otherwise, I want to send out a massive, massive hug to everybody who uh, is watching this, everybody who is scared and uncomfortable or feeling um, all the feelings. They are, they are normal, they are, they are okay. What you're feeling is okay. Um, the important thing is that you're showing up for yourselves, for each other, and for us. Um, you're beautiful. Yes. I, I I love you all. Yes. Thank you. Love you. Love you all. Um, right thank on. you for, for being being vulnerable with us. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for sharing with compassion and strength and resilience. Um, we are all in this together. Um, make sure that you go into this week with love in your hearts and a great big smile because that is one of the best weapons. Uh, be your own kind of superhero, guys. Spread love like it's going out of fashion. And please don't just forget to call, don't just not forget to call your mum, but call your brothers, call your sisters, call your family, call your friends. Check in on each other. Um, it is now more than ever that we uh, that we need to show up. And Cody, I think. Did you have something more that you wanted to say before we sign off, my love? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's that to the globalization point. I, I think um, to that I say, look inside. When you heal within, you heal without. It's very easy to focus on the bigger picture and forget about the times in your own history mm -hmm. when you, you have done something that was racist mm -hmm. and harmful and you hurt somebody. And what you're seeing right now is that hurt being expressed. So heal within, try to find those places where that pain existed that you may have caused. Remember it, rectify it, do something. Um, you have to come to terms with it. And I, I think through that, you'll find a path to deal with the outside world from where you are, because where you are is in your own world, your own, your own bubble, and it's different from anybody else's. It's special, very special. I think that should really go for just like super yes, super yes. We're not just a country, we're a planet. That goes for absolutely everybody. I think one of the big topics of next time should be colorism. Because racism is not just. Oh, we have many topics. We have many topics. Yes, like I said, stay tuned for more, guys. Yeah. Be good, be kind, spread love like it's going out of fashion, be your own kind of superhero, and call everyone. Love. Love you all. Love you all. I'm Deborah Baldwin, Polk's baby boy. God bless you. Peace. <laughs>